So let me ask you a question. Who's, who's the most hated villain of all time? Who's the most hated villain in TV and books and movies and in history? <laughs> who's the most hated villain of all time? Is it Darth Vader? Is it Malfoy? Siler of Heroes, if you remember him? Khan of Star Trek? Voldemort? Sauron? Newman? Is it Newman? Is it Biff? from uh, Back to the Future. Oh, that Sansei from Karate Kid, from the original Karate Kid, remember him? Kubla Kai or something. Is it Skeletor? Is it, is it Agent Smith from The Matrix? Well, I challenge you to come up with a more hated villain than the following character. It's Joffrey Baratheon of Game of Thrones or the book series, A Song of Ice and Fire. I don't know of any other villain that is hated more than Joffrey Baratheon. And if you're a fan of the books or the series, you will know fully well what I'm talking about. No one compares to him. Darth Vader, you can have some sympathy for eventually. Malfoy, same sort of thing. Even Siler, you have some sympathy for. You know, Sauron is, is horrible, but he isn't horrible in a in hundred different ways the way that Joffrey Baratheon is. So I've been asking around, preparing for this episode, and everyone says, when I say, you know, you know who, who, is there any worse villain than Joffrey, Joffrey Baratheon? And, and no one can seem to come up with someone worse than him, unless they've never read the books or watched the show, and then in which case they, they say, what are you talking about, nerd? And, and it's interesting, too, because if you're a history buff like me, you'll see many parallels between him and many infamous rulers throughout history. There are multiple figures in, in history that uh, rise to the horribleness that is Joffrey Bar Baratheon and, and even surpass it. So, so it's, it's interesting to contemplate that uh, a person like this actually did rule kingdoms and, and lands. So as a thought exercise for this podcast, I, I imagined what it would be like if Joffrey were a client of mine. You know, what, what would be my assessment? So in this episode, I'll present my psychological assessment of King Joffrey. I'll provide background and analysis and that sort of stuff. So there, there will be spoilers. And if you're a fan, then this might be fun for you. And if you're not, then I have no idea if this will, this will be fun for you. But, um, but here we go. So Prince Joffrey Baratheon, as he starts off when the series begins, is the eldest son and heir of King Robert Baratheon and Queen Cersei Lannister. So he, he's, the oldest, he's the oldest child. He has two younger siblings, Princess Marcella and Prince Tommen. He's 12 years old at the beginning of the book series. Some of you might be surprised by that. But um, that's, that's the situation. He's 12 when the books start. And incidentally, um, he dies when he's 13. Again, spoiler alert there. <laughs> but uh, he, you know, the, the entire span of what we know of him uh, occurs from the ages of 12 and 13. So just in, something to think about. Because I think a lot of times people think of him as being like 17 or something. But he's really quite young. He's described in the books as having the quote-unquote Lannister look. He's tall for his age. He's handsome. In the books, he's described as much more handsome than the character on the TV uh, uh, series. So it's just something to think about as well. He has blonde, curly hair, and he has green eyes, and he is said to have pouty lips. And he always wears the finest clothing as many Lannisters do. All right, so that's just a brief description of him. What, what do we know about his childhood? Well, Joffrey was spoiled by his parents, particularly his mother. Being the heir to the throne, he was treated like a god since birth. You know, it's something to, to think about. It's a different sort of society. The society of Westeros is, is different. I guess it'd be like if you were the president's child or... If you were Brangelina's child, you get treated differently than other children get treated, and, and he uh, was uh, treated that way. His father, King Robert, was deeply disappointed with Joffrey, 
And Joffrey probably knew this. In fact, it's pretty much for sure that he knew this and was not happy about that and, and was hurt by that. The king felt little affection for Joffrey and showed signs of even hating him. So imagine you're a young boy and you know that your father hates you. That's, that's quite a uh, blow to your self-esteem and your self-worth and self-concept. Joffrey, in the books, he craved his father's respect and approval. For example, once after learning a kitchen cat was pregnant, he killed the animal and cut open its belly to see the kittens inside. Quite, quite shocking. He brought one of the unborn kittens to his father, and King Joffrey, his father, was so shocked and so upset that he hit Joffrey in the face so hard that it knocked two of his teeth out, two of his baby teeth out. He was young. Uh, and so there, there are multiple kind of stories like this indicating that Joffrey didn't always know how to please his father and would frequently mess things up and that the father would abuse him physically or verbally or emotionally. And Queen Cersei, Joffrey's mother, uh, said in the books that her husband, Joffrey's father, would, would have beaten Joffrey if she hadn't stopped it. So that's what Joffrey's childhood was like. Joffrey reportedly bullied his younger brother, Tommen. He drank a lot of wine, as many children apparently did back then in Westeros, which is just another thing to note. Um, okay, so this brings me to the beginning of the book series, and there's one story that I think depicts his character. So Joffrey was riding with Sansa, Sansa Stark, and he was drinking wine and getting drunk, and Joffrey, Joffrey was trying to impress Sansa, being a young 12-year-old, and I think at this point Joffrey and Sansa were betrothed to get married, and so, and Sansa was enamored with, with Joffrey. And Joffrey and Sansa came upon Sansa's younger sister, Arya, and Arya's friend, Micah, whom is a butcher's boy. And Arya and Micah, the, the young girl and the young boy, are practicing sword fighting with, with wooden sticks. And Joffrey, Prince Joffrey, is drunk and commands Micah, the butcher's boy, to spar with him. Presumably, he wanted to show off to Sansa and maybe even Arya. And he sees himself as a, as a warrior. You know, he, he thinks of himself as a, as a powerful warrior. I'm guessing because whenever he would spar with the guards, that they would always let him win because you, you let the heir to the throne win because you don't want the heir to the throne disliking you. So Joffrey challenges Micah, the butcher's boy, to spar with him. The butcher's boy refuses because he knows it will be bad for him, and he's terrified of Prince Joffrey. Joffrey bullies Micah with his own sword, which is called Lion's Tooth. You know, it's an actual sword against a stick. And, you know, again, he's presumably doing this to impress Sansa. Arya, the young girl, smacks Joffrey with her stick, and in the confusion, Micah, the butcher's boy, runs away scared because he's terrified of Joffrey because Joffrey has a reputation, you know, of being cruel. And Joffrey at this point tries to kill Arya with his sword. So Arya, you know, is trying to defend the butcher's boy and then uh, hits Joffrey. And then Joffrey, you know, and Arya is using a stick that's non-lethal. And then Joffrey tr takes a swipe at Arya with his own sword, which is, you know, terrifying. And then in defense of Arya, uh, Arya's direwolf, her, her pet direwolf, Nymeria, attacks Joffrey and slightly injures him. You know, uh, the direwolf isn't trying to kill Joffrey, but is just trying to protect Arya, as a good pet will do. And in the melee, Joffrey loses his sword, Lion's Tooth, the sword Lion's Tooth. They, they name their swords in Westeros. Arya takes the sword from, from him and throws it into the river and Joffrey is humiliated. Later, Joffrey tells his father and the others in the court that he had been attacked by Micah and the direwolf for no reason. So he lies and says, you know, these two people just attacked him for no reason. 
And the king doesn't know what to do. Uh, he's trying to please his son, and he, you know he doesn't want to humiliate his son, so he's trying to work something out. The queen, Cersei, being the evil Lannister that she is, orders that Micah, the butcher's boy, be killed along with Arya's direwolf, and the king goes along with this decision. But Arya's direwolf cannot be found, and incidentally, I'm trying to think, does the direwolf ever get found? I don't know. But can't be found, and so Queen Cersei insists that Sansa's direwolf, Lady, the direwolf, the name is Lady, should be killed instead. And to follow in the tradition of the North, Ned Stark is sadly forced to execute Sansa's direwolf himself in the Stark tradition. And eventually, Sir Sandor Clegane, or the Hound, he eventually finds Micah and cuts him in half with one swing of his sword. Later, uh, Renly Baratheon, the king's younger brother, openly laughs at his nephew Joffrey for being beaten and disarmed by a girl younger than him. So this whole incident, I think, depicts Joffrey's personality, his tendencies, his behavior, his motivations, and also the, the world in which he lived. You know, not only was he a big jerk face to people, but he had his mother and father, the king and queen, whom would please him and do what he wanted to and um, get back at his enemies. And he uh, was a bully, but he was also ridiculed by people frequently. So there's that story. Another story here, a little shorter, is that if you remember from the books and the TV show, Bran, Brandon Stark, was pushed out of the window by Jamie uh, because Bran saw Jamie and Cersei having some mommy and daddy time. And it was thought he, he might die. You know, Bran was, um, he, he didn't recover quickly. And uh, the doctors thought that Bran might actually just die a slow death. And Joffrey overheard his father, the king, saying that it would be merciful if Bran just died quickly instead of slowly. And so Joffrey, overhearing his father say this, to impress his father, he hired a thug to kill Bran. So if you remember again from the books and the TV show, a thug breaks into Bran's room while he's unconscious, recovering from his injuries, and tries to kill Bran, tries to slat, you know, slit his throat, and Bran's mother stops the assassination and i believe one of the direwolves comes in it's probably brand's direwolf saves the day and incidentally Tyrion was implicated in this attempted murder so uh, so that's just another story of joffrey trying to impress his father which is a theme uh failing miserably at that task and just causing a lot of problems around him so uh, that's another story that depicts his personality. So moving forward in this story, in the TV show and the books, and incidentally, I have read the books. Well, I haven't read the books. I listened to the books. Sometimes I wonder if it's okay for me to say I've read the books when I've actually listened to the books. I've read parts of the books. Does that make it better? It's funny that we put privilege on reading a book as opposed to listening to a book, as opposed to watching the TV show. You know, it's definitely a ranking culturally in terms of our social construction around what is more impressive. But anyway, I've listened to the books. They're really fantastic to listen to because the actor, you know, will uh, have different voices for the different characters, puts a lot of emphasis on things. Anyway, the point is, is that I've listened to the books uh, well before the TV show came out, which makes me super cool. So, in the story, the, the uh, king, he eventually dies, as you know. And uh, around that time, Ned Stark, the hand of the king at the time, discovers that Joffrey and his siblings are actually bastards born of incest between Cersei and her twin brother, Jaime. So, Ned discovers this. Ned confronts the queen with this information and threatens to out the information which would make Joffrey not the heir to the throne. Cersei, in, a, in an attempt to uh, preserve Joffrey's rights to the throne and maybe even her own rights to be the mother of the future king, protects Joffrey's right to the... Cersei, she 
secretly arranges for King Robert's death so, so that Joffrey will be king quickly, so she'll have power, so she can put Ned down because he's threatening the, her power and her family's power. So, so Cersei uh, has a number of different measures in place to make sure that the king is dead, and one of them works in that she gets somebody to, I think, get the king really drunk on a hunting expedition, and a wild boar guts him, and he slowly dies. Then Ned, after King Robert dies, produces the king's will, saying that Joffrey is not the king, and Cersei tears it up, and then later, when Joffrey is king, he claims that Ned is a traitor and executes him against everyone's wishes, including Cersei. Nobody wants Ned to be executed because everyone knows that that will be horrible politically. And after Joffrey kills Ned, it is horribly politically for the kingdom, and it causes a massive civil war. Rob Stark, Ned's son, rises up in the north and starts marching south and probably would have eventually won if it wasn't for the Red Wedding the horrible Red Wedding. So Joffrey at this point is elevated to king quite suddenly. And he's elevated to king at a time when there is a lot of political unrest. And this was most likely quite anxiety provoking for him. He didn't know who to trust. And even his uncle, the Hand, Tyrion, even he seemed to be against Joffrey. So just imagine what it would be like. I mean, whether or not you like him or not, which I'm sure you don't, but just imagine what it would be like to be suddenly you're the king of the seven kingdoms or seven houses or I don't know, but this, you're king of something. <laughs> you're king of Westeros and the country is in a civil war. You're 12 years old and you don't know who to trust. And you know that no one thinks you're competent and many people hate you, but you have all the power at your disposal. So that, that would be a qu quite interesting situation to be in. Uh, I mean, just think back in your own life to when you were 12 years old. What is that, like sixth grade, fifth grade or something? Imagine being president of the United States when you were in the sixth grade. You're suddenly president of the United States. Imagine how many stupid decisions you would make and imagine how scared you would be you know, uh, so, you know, if you have any kind of heart in your chest, you might have a little bit of empathy for Joffrey in that situation. I don't know. But any compassion you have for him will be quickly snuffed out by me reminding you that Joffrey sadistically ordered his guards to beat Sansa whenever her brother's victories in the North occurred. So whenever Rob Stark would win in the North, Joffrey would have his guards beat Sansa which is um, quite a horrible thing to do to somebody. He also forced her to look at her father's severed head, which was, I think, on a pike somewhere. He claimed he would beat Rob Stark in single combat, which no one else believed but him. He was a terrible king, and the people began to hate him. He was nearly killed in a riot as a result. In order to combine the houses of Lannister and Tyrell. He was offered Marjorie Tyrell's hand in, mar in marriage, and he quickly dropped Sansa like a sack of potatoes. He also declared that he would rape Sansa after his wedding, even though she was married to his uncle Tyrion eventually, which is a horrible thing to say and intend to do. When he heard about Rob Stark's death at the Red Wedding, he wanted to serve Rob's head to Sansa at his wedding, but I believe people stopped him. So again, this is another story about his personality shining through, that he loved to harm other people, even though no one around him approved. So it just tells you something about who he was. He frequently alienated himself from the few allies that he had, including the new hand of the king, his grandfather, Tywin Lannister. This was one person that he could depend upon, and for some reason he even alienated him. So he, he had very few friends. In, in some ways you could, you could say that his only ally was his mom, and 
she proved herself to be the sort of mother that would love any child for any reason, as most mothers would. And then we all rejoiced when, during his wedding to Marjorie, Marjorie's mother, Olena Redwine, and Peter Baelish conspired to kill the king and poisoned him. Some of you might not know this because I don't know if they showed it in the TV series, but Olena Redwine and Peter Baelish were the people that conspired to to kill Joffrey for a number of reasons. Uh, Elena didn't want her daughter, Marjorie, to suffer as Joffrey's wife. Everyone knew that Marjorie was in all likelihood going to get abused somehow by Joffrey. And so Elena didn't want that for her daughter. And knew that and Elena knew that Marjorie, once made queen, could choose her husband and she could choose Tommen, which, you know, we all know this, that's what's occurring. Um, and presumably Littlefinger uh, conspired to kill the king because he wanted Sansa for himself. And he also wanted to make allies with people who didn't like Joffrey. So, you know, P- Peter Baelish, Littlefinger loves Sansa because Sansa is his mother's daughter because he's in love with his, he's in love with Sansa's mother. And he implicated Tyrion in the killing of King Joffrey. It's very complicated, but he essentially gets rid of Tyrion to separate Sansa so that he can have Sansa for himself. Anyway, but long story short, King Joffrey, Joffrey Baratheon, died at the age of 13 after being king for about one or two years. And that's the end of his life. So what can we say about his personality? Well, here are just some descriptions of his personality that I came up with. When things went wrong in his life, he tended to blame other people. In fact, he probably always blamed other people. He was reckless. He was cruel to people. He was vicious. He was not bright. He was not the brightest bulb in the pack. He made many bad judgments throughout the book and even in the historical accounts. He was strong-willed. He had an uncontrollable temper. He was sadistic and I'll get into more of that later. He had little sense of right or wrong. He was narcissistic. He thought he could do anything. He thought the world revolved around him. He was psychopathic. You might say he was antisocial. He was definitely dishonest and cowardly. And he was incompetent as a king. Okay, so let's analyze this guy. Why did he do so many hurtful things? Why was Joffrey the way that he was? Again, this is a fictional character, so it's fiction. But, but as a thought exercise, let's, let's try to come up with reasons as to why Joffrey would have done what he uh, did, why his personality was the way that it was. Because the fact of the matter is, is that he did not benefit from a lot of the horrible things that he did. So a lot of the things that he did were counter to probably his goals, which were presumably to be respected, to be liked, to get what he wanted out of people. You know, why would he do so many things that basically was shooting himself in his own foot? So the first possibility that I want to look at is his relationship with his father. As I was mentioning earlier, it was clear that his father hated him. His father disapproved of him and probably neglected him emotionally. Joffrey was hurt and angry about this and wanted love and approval from his father, but did not get it. At the same time, he was a prince and heir to the throne, so he was elevated in his society. And this might have led to severe narcissism and insecure attachment. He was constantly trying to impress his father. And maybe in his child mind, he thought he could impress his father by being a fierce warrior like his father. And maybe he thought that if he was without fear and he was cruel to his enemies the way his father was, maybe that would impress his father. So maybe it was that Joffrey was not bright enough to understand that his actions was not actually impressive to his father, but maybe he, in his his perception, uh, his cruelty and the way that he bullied other people, maybe that would get his father to love him. So getting back to the narcissism bit, he was very insecure as a person as a result of 
possibly his relationship with his father. And again, at the same time, he's heir to the throne. He's like, basically, he's the next king and everyone treats him as that. So on one hand, he feels horrible about himself. He feels terrible. He feels worthless. But on the other hand, he has a lot of worth and a lot of power. And so sometimes people will develop these narcissistic personalities as a way of coping with extremely low self-worth. And when your self-worth is challenged, you strike back very quickly and harshly to assert your dominance and your superiority as a way of protecting even yourself from the notion that you are in fact worthless. Even though you're not actually worthless, you just feel that you are. So that might be one of the reasons or a few of the reasons why Joffrey was the way that he was. So now let's look at his relationship with his mother. I wouldn't be a stereotypical therapist if I didn't blame it on the mother, right? So it's difficult to tell from the books what his relationship was really like with his mother. It was clear that his mother really cared about him and loved him or in, in whatever way that she, she could. But for, in, for instance, she stopped her husband from beating him. So she cared about Joffrey enough to do that. But the Lannisters aren't really known for being warm and fuzzy. So maybe she wasn't particularly emotionally warm with him. It's hard to tell. But maybe she was. You know, maybe hard to tell. But so maybe there was an attachment issue there with her that might have been at play. He was he was definitely spoiled by her and would let him get away with things. And so this might have added to his narcissism and sense of entitlement. Um, you know, all children need to understand uh, where their limits lie. Anyone who has raised children knows that uh, people don't come out of the womb with a very clear understanding of their entitlement. <laughs> um, three-year-olds say, it's mine and give me it and... I feel like throwing this rock at your head and I'm going to do it because I want to. And, you know, slowly over time with parenting, children learn the difference between what they have the right to do and what they don't. And, you know, for instance, they might have the right to say that their toys are their toys and they get to and, and they get to play with their toys when they want to. But they can't take someone else's toy, even though they have an impulse to do so. Well, if the father was not around and the mother was spoiling him and he was not feeling very good about himself, Joffrey might have grown up with a severe sense of entitlement and a, an attitude, an unchecked narcissistic attitude of entitlement that, that young children will have, but they usually will grow out of through appropriate parenting. And maybe Joffrey wasn't given that parenting by his parents. So just another idea as to why Joffrey would have been the way that he was. Another reason, aside from his relationship with his father and mother, is the relationship between the parents. There's a lot of evidence in the books that he was deeply affected by his parents' abusive and conflictual relationship. His parents, Robert Baratheon and Cersei Lannister, the king and queen, were noticeably not happy with each other. Um, the king was drinking all the time and having sex with all sorts of different women, high and low-born women, and having children. He had, I don't know, something like 30 different bastards around the city. And he, I think, would beat her. And she, you know, would obviously not be happy about those sorts of things. And she wasn't a very warm and fuzzy person herself. And I don't think she ever even wanted to marry him. And the fact that they never had kids sort of tells you something about their relationship, you know, since all of her children were actually Jamie's children. So Joffrey grew up in this environment, seeing his parents very upset with each other. And we all know that that takes a toll on a child's development. And just to exemplify this, uh, another story for you. At the Hands Tourney, at the Hands Tournament, when Ned became the Hand and the King uh, through a tournament... Joffrey was being very charming with Sansa because they were betrothed, I believe, at the time. Joffrey was being very charming and, and was uh, nice to Sansa. And Sansa is, you know, she's just extremely happy about how everything's working out, that she's going to be the queen. And it's because in her mind, it was all, you know, 
prince and princesses and all the wonderful romantic stories. And it was all turning out the way that she thought it would. But then at this tournament, the king, King Robert, Joffrey's father, shouts at the queen that she can't tell him what to do. Uh, you know, he gets in an open, loud fight and verbally abuses his wife in, in front of everybody and, and Joffrey too. And immediately, Joff becomes distant and he becomes sort of cold and, and he quickly distances himself from Sansa and Sansa notices this. So this is a story in which we can see that Joffrey was deeply affected by the conflict between his parents, that for, for any child, they desperately want a secure base upon which they can venture off into the world and return to when they need to. And when your parents are fighting with each other, the secure base is not there. And that is extremely disturbing to children and can cause a lot of distress and anxiety and insecurity about who loves you. You know, if, if your parents can't love each other, then by implication, they might not love you. Or if you displease them somehow the way that they displease each other, maybe you'll be rejected in the same way. This is the toll that parental conflict and divorce has on children. Not that divorce always causes this. Uh, well, not that uh, this sort of thing is always a significant issue in someone's personality, but if you've ever been through a divorce as a child, you will know that it, it doesn't feel good. It's disheartening. On the other hand, if you see your parents fighting all the time and over time you just wish they would break up because you can't stand them being around each other anymore, then by the time they get divorced, you actually are happy about it. But going back to the time when they were fighting, that is not a pleasing experience for children by any stretch of the imagination. So, so that's another reason as to why Joffrey might have been disturbed. He absorbed all this negativity and the... Um, result of that might have been a lot of his cruelty and his bad decision making. All right, so we've looked at his relationship with his father, his relationship with his mother, and his, the relationship between the parents. Another possibility that I thought of was that he was frequently seen as looking like a girl. For instance, Jon Snow and others thought that Joffrey looked like a girl and remarked as such. You know, he was very pretty and had curly locks and was very fair. And you wonder what kind of effect that could have on a young man. He's 12 years old and he wants to assert his manliness. He wants to be king. His father is very macho and very manly. And everyone thinks he looks like a girl. And there's a lot of oppression around that in Westeros, it, it seems as is in our society. You know, if you grow up in our society and you are a young boy and people think that you're not very manly, then you get made fun of. And sometimes that can take a toll on your personality and you want you might want to start acting really ultra macho just to compensate for this. And what's one way to act super macho? Well, you become extremely aggressive and hostile and assertive and make people fear you. That is associated with masculinity, unfortunately. And so maybe that was one of the reasons why Joffrey did what he did was because he was trying to assert his manhood. Another reason to look at is genetics. We all know that Joffrey was the offspring of incest. Cersei and her twin brother, Jamie were having an affair or some kind of relationship and had the three children. And inbreeding can cause many genetic issues. I'm not a geneticist or a biologist, so I don't know much about it, but I know that much. Uh, I tried to look up research regarding whether or not incest and inbreeding can lead to sadism and personality problems. And I only found a little bit, but there's not a lot of research on this, and so I, I don't know if we know the answer to that question as to whether or not inbreeding can cause antisocial behavior. It seems possible, but you know, lots of things seem possible that uh, are not shown by science. So, you know, maybe that was a factor too. But certainly, we can think about people in history 
who were sadistic and not the result of incest. So, uh, you know, it's unclear as to whether or not that would have been a factor. All right, so we've looked at the relationship with mother and father, relationship between the parents, this looking like a girl issue and the inbreeding issue, and now we have other biological factors. For instance, the mother was a big drinker, as many people were. She drank to cope. She was under a lot of stress and didn't have a lot of support and would turn to alcohol to numb her distress. And her relationship with her husband, king, the king, King Robert, was, as we know, was very stressful. And she might have been drinking maybe even heavily during the time of her getting pregnant with Joffrey. She was also potentially under a lot of stress during the pregnancy. So alcohol, excessive alcohol and stress can cause problems genetically. The mother, you know, just to describe why she would have been in so much stress around the time of, the, of her pregnancy with Joffrey, this is her first child, and she probably suspected it was Jamie's. And she was probably terrified that once the baby was born, that it would be clear that the baby was not King Roberts, who had dark hair and dark features, whereas Jamie and Cersei had blonde and fair features. And so if the child is very blonde and looks a lot like Jamie, which he did, the mother was probably quite stressed out during the pregnancy about what would happen as a result of that. So the mother during the pregnancy was quite stressed out, which might have caused some issues regarding fetus development. And again, I'm not a biologist, so I, I don't even know the language for such things, but I know that much. So another possible reason as to why Joffrey was the way that he was can be informed by systems theory. Family systems theory is quite weird to many people, but I have been studying it and thinking about it for a long time, so it comes pretty easily to me. And I find that the explanations that it provides can sometimes be very useful. However, many people think they're quite wacky. So let me uh, lay this down for you. So according to family systems theory, families operate as a whole, that you have individuals within the system, but the system also has its own life, so to speak, its own psyche, so to speak, its own motivations. For instance, one way of looking at the family of Robert and Cersei and the children is that there was a big problem in this family. You had a physically abusive relationship that the you know, father was beating the mother. The mother was cheating on the father. The father was cheating on the mother. The parents hated each other, and yet there seemed to be no resolution. <laughs> in my head, I just imagined the two of them going to couples therapy. Maybe I'll do an episode on that in the future. But anyway... So you have a family that is quite distressed and doesn't seem to have any solution ahead of them. Well, one of the ways that systems will try to find solutions, and again, I'm, I'm phrasing this as if the system is an entity in and of itself. So when a system is distressed, when a family system is under um, distress, it tries to seek solutions to its problems. And each individual within the system unconsciously will carry out behaviors that will lead to solutions along, this, along these lines. And maybe this is confusing, but for instance, Joffrey might have been elected by the system to act the way that he did in order to distract the family in such a way that they did not have to face their problems. So Another way of describing this is that you have big problems between the parents. And Joffrey, say, is four or five years old. And Joffrey feels this tension, as everybody does. And Joffrey is trying to get them to stop. He wants them to come together, as all children do. And he starts experimenting with different behaviors. He doesn't know, he, you know, if you ask the four-year-old Joffrey, why are, you know, what, what's your motivation today? He would just say normal four-year-old four -year stuff. But inside, unconsciously, people do things based on the effect. And so when 
he, for instance, was a good boy and was quiet, that did not solve the problem. The parents continued to fight. And so when he was a good boy, he wasn't rewarded for that. But when he's a bad boy, it's possible that that stopped the fighting temporarily. So even though he was being punished or yelled at by his father, the overall tension in the family was being reduced because the family was temporarily distracted from their problem, and now it's focused on Joffrey's four-year-old behavior. So it's possible that Joffrey was rewarded for this and that the family depended on Joffrey to fulfill this role and to fulfill this purpose of distracting the family from the real problem. And over time, this begins to become rigid, and Joffrey ends up having his role become a part of his personality and a part of his routine way of thinking, to the point where if Joffrey was in a different system that didn't need him to act that way, he would still continue to act that way out of habit. So that's a systemic way of looking at why Joffrey might have been the way that he was. Okay, so another reason that I thought about that I alluded to earlier, was that Joffrey was spoiled. It doesn't seem that the parents had a very good approach to him. The father rejected and abused him, while the mother just gave him whatever he wanted, it seems. And so that is not good parenting. As any parent would know, (laughs) that when you neglect a child and abuse them, that's not good. And that when you let them get away with literally murder, that is also not good. They need limits. So um, that is another possible reason as to why he was the way that he was. I've had clients like this before, and you know, by the time they're 15, 14 years old, it's, it's difficult to repair the damage done that spoiling does to children. But it can be done, but it just takes a lot of time. So another reason that I thought about was he was possibly traumatized. A lot of personality disorders are associated with trauma, and he was clearly abused by his father. And another trauma that I thought about was that his mother basically killed his father, and rumors were you know, around at the time, and he probably heard them, and it was no mystery that his mother hated his father. And when his father died... It was rumored that the mother had been a part of that. And imagine the trauma involved in that. Imagine how traumatic that would be for you as a 12-year-old boy that you discover, or at least a lot of people think, and there's reasons to believe, that your mother has killed your father. I mean, that must have been traumatic for him, just really difficult. So there were other traumas as well, like he was nearly killed in a riot. And also in Westeros, he saw a lot of death and he saw a lot of people's lives treated very inhumanely. So these are a lot of traumas for someone to go through. Not that he was particularly unique in this way, in this world, but he went through a lot of difficult times, and sometimes traumas can result in personality disorders like sadism. Maybe the sadism, uh, maybe he had a uh, disposition for the potential to be a sadist, and these traumas pushed him over the edge biologically, and he became sadistic as a result. So another possible reason for why Joffrey was the way that he was was be one angle of looking at it is through life stage. You know, there are different stages in life, so to speak, and there's a lot of research in this. And some people think that these models are not useful, but sometimes they can be. So you know, what do most 13-year-olds, 12-year-olds go, th- go through? Well, they, they are still somewhat often defiant of authority or they're developing defiance to authority. They're trying to find themselves. They're often the most insecure people. You know, think of middle school when, and early high school when people are at their most insecure. So he was at that stage in life, and he might have been trying to find himself. And in an effort to individuate, in an effort to find himself, he might have turned to these aggressive behaviors as a way of trying to discover who he was. A lot of people are like this when they're 12 and 13, not, not the majority of people, but you know, a good number of people have very um, 
dubious morals, we'll say, and later end up growing out of it. So might Joffrey ha- have grown out of this if he was given enough time? It's an interesting you know, thought to have. Might he have learned? Might he have come around? Uh, doesn't seem like it, but but I've heard. I mean, I've heard and worked with clients who will tell me about things like this, where they will say, "Man, when I was thirteen and fourteen, I was horrible to my parents. I was abusive, verbally and physically. I one time hit my own grandmother in the face. I, you know, lots of just horrible stories, and they." would never do anything like that as an adult because the brain hasn't fully developed yet and people are still trying to figure out who they are and what's and the difference between what right and wrong and how to navigate certain impulses and and certain desires that adults often will figure out but 12 and 13 year olds might not yet so maybe joffrey was a victim of his own development in that situation you know you know you wonder what it would have been like if Joffrey's family wasn't royal, wasn't royalty. What if they were just a regular, you know, farming family? Would Joffrey have been the same way? Because the pressures would have been different and the life would have been different. It's just interesting to think about. Okay, so the the last area I want to go into as to, you know, possible explanations for why Joffrey was the way that he was has to do with psychodynamic reasons, psychodynamic analysis. So due to the pain he was feeling on the inside from all of these difficulties that he experienced in life and and his own inner struggles, his ego employed a number of possible defense mechanisms to cope and ameliorate this inner psychic pain. So this is the premise behind defense mechanisms in psychodynamic understanding, is that when you have inner pain, and we all suffer from some amount of particular inner inner pains in our in our personalities. We use defense mechanisms to protect ourselves from that pain, and it's a natural thing that everybody does. Where did this pain come from for Joffrey? Well, as I mentioned earlier, lots of attachment issues. Uh, he internalized his relationship between his parents. He internalized the relationship between his parents. You know, when children are growing up, they will internalize things around them. They'll internalize their relationships with their significant others, with, you know, with their, with their caregivers and their parents. They'll even internalize the relationships they see outside of them. So Joffrey had internalized this very conflictual, abusive, terrible relationship between his parents. It becomes a part of him. He takes it in, and the outward conflict becomes an inner conflict. Inner voices inside of him begin to rage against each other. Parts of his personality start to war against each other. This results in internal conflict and negative self-talk and a desire to find relief through defense mechanisms, one of which is denial. So he might have employed the defense mechanism of denial. For instance, he, he had to have known that he was not the king's son. There were many rumors, and it was obvious to anyone who was paying attention, that Joffrey was not the king's son, and in fact was Jamie's son. And so I suspect that a part of him knew this, but it was too difficult to accept. It meant that he was a monster. It meant that he was not the heir to the throne. It meant that he was a disgrace, a bastard a result of incest, and this would have created tremendous shame for him and also a fear for his life. So you can imagine the inner struggle that would be going on for him. And so one way to deal with that struggle is to go into denial, to say that it's not true. It's not happening. I am Robert's son. It's obvious, you know. And this probably took a toll on his personality, this level of denial, this this pressure that needed to be kept on the acknowledgement that he was not the king's son. This denial might have led to strain in his personality that led to him being cruel to others. Another defense mechanism is acting out. Acting out is performing an extreme behavior in order to express thoughts or feelings the person 
feels incapable of expressing otherwise. So instead of communicating his fear and his longing for his father, instead he acted out and was hostile. You know, when, a, when a person acts out their problems, it, it can act as a pressure release and often helps the individual feel calmer and more at, at peace and more equilibrium. So he's sitting alone and he's feeling terrible and he's watching his parents fight and he doesn't know what to do with it. So as a, a, a sort of catharsis, he found that when he was cruel to other people, this, this released him of this inner tension and he felt better afterwards. So that might have been another reason as to why he had this habit of being cruel. Another defense mechanism is reaction formation. Reaction formation is the converting of unwanted or dangerous or distressing thoughts, feelings, or impulses into their opposites. So it's sort of weird, but I've seen people do this. So, so let's say that Joffrey really wanted to be tender with people, and he really wanted to be loved, and he really wanted attention, and he really wanted acceptance. But instead, because this is so dangerous for him to express, because he doesn't feel he can trust anyone. I mean, imagine Joffrey saying, I, Father, I want your love. I, I'm, I, I feel so rejected by you. you know, that, what would his father have said? His father probably would not have reacted very well to that. So, or at least you can imagine Joffrey believing that to be true. And so because it's dangerous to, to express and to even acknowledge those longing feelings, a defense mechanism might be employed to deal with that by converting it into its opposite, which is cruelty and rejection and getting people to hate you. So he might have chosen cruelty and getting people to hate him as a way of reacting to what his real desire was, which is for love and for people to love him and for tenderness in the world. So reaction formation might have been another reason as to why he was the way that he was. Another defense, me me another defense mechanism that I thought might have been at play was dis displacement. Displacement is when someone redirects their thoughts or feelings or impulses at one person toward a different thing or person. So the classic example is the father gets a, you know verbally abused by his boss at work, and he comes home, and then he kicks the dog. So that's a classic displacement example. So it's possible that Joffrey, because he was so hurt by his father, and as a result so angry at his father, he might have displaced all that anger towards his father towards other people. We often will displace anger that we feel we can't express. Like, you know, the example with the boss, you have someone's boss yell at you. Well, you have, you have, if your boss yells at you and you don't feel very secure in that relationship, you're not, you might not feel very safe in saying, I'm angry at you. You might just take it and then go behind his back and, and talk crap about him. Well, it's very possible that Joffrey did not feel safe to say to his father that he was angry. And so the anger has to come out some way. And so he directed it toward other people that were easy targets for him to be cruel toward. So it could be displacement at play. Other things at play that I won't go into are superiority complex and downward social comparison. Another psychodynamic idea that might have been at play was compartmentalization and dehumanization. But for the sake of time, I won't go into them. The last defense mechanism I want to go into is projective identification. And this is one that I use often as a way of understanding people's odd behavior. I was thinking that Joffrey internalized his father's rejection and potentially his mother's lack of warmth and his parents' relationship with each other. So a way of looking at this is that He's in his relationship with his father, and his father is rejecting him. And he sees that. He sees that his father is rejecting him. He also sees himself that he is being rejected. And so he internalizes this relationship. He internalizes both his father rejecting him and himself being rejected. And it becomes this internal representation in his psyche that becomes 
bolstered over time over repetition. His father continually rejects him. He continually feels rejected, and this becomes a part of his personality. And one of the things that happens over time is that this internal representation starts to battle with itself, that there's a part of Joffrey that hates himself, and there's a part of Joffrey that feels hated even by himself. And this happens internally and, and largely unconsciously. And so this is you know, creating a lot of inner tension. Well, one of the ways to cope with this inner tension is to externalize it. And it, it, you know, it, it temporarily feels better to externalize an internal conflict. It, there's a lot of tension that builds up over time if you, if you can't find relief and if it's just occurring internally for somebody. So instead of having this war go on inside of him where a part of him hates himself and another part of him feels hated, he externalizes one side of that. And he, and he identifies with one side. So he identifies with the rejection part, and he imposes the, the feeling of rejection onto other people. So he creates social situations in which they feel the way he feels, and he acts the way he feels as though he, and he acts the way he thinks his father is acting towards him. So he creates social situations in which he rejects other people through cruelty and through hostility while elevating himself. This is an externalization of something that was originally internalized from his family in, from multiple different re, uh, directions. This is projective identification in that you project a part of yourself onto other people. He's, he's projecting his weak, rejected self onto other people and socializing them or manipulating them to feel that way. And then in this way, you, he has the fantasy that he no longer is rejected because they're rejected. It's someone outside of him that's rejected. It's not him. And this is how we all seek sometimes to relieve ourselves of inner tension. We will project parts of ourselves on other people, manipulate them, socialize them to act accordingly to our projection, and then we react against it. it. It feels better to us. It's the lesser of two evils because it's, it's not ultimately a good thing to experience, but it's better than having the inner conflict without relief. Looking through this lens, we see examples of this throughout the books. He was attracted to situations in which he could project his weak and inferior self-concept onto other people. For instance, as I talked about earlier, when he came upon the boy, uh, Micah, the butcher's boy, play fighting with Arya, well, Micah, the butcher's boy, is a, is a weak person compared to Prince Joffrey, and Prince Joffrey knows this. Prince Joffrey rides up on a horse and has an actual sword, and this, this butcher's boy just has a stick, and he sees Micah as this pathetic person, and projects his inner pathetic self-concept onto Micah, and in an effort to snuff out his own inner pathetic person, he tries to snuff out Micah. He's trying to punish Micah for being pathetic, but in reality, he has an ongoing inner conflict where he is abusing himself regarding his own pathetic self-concept. So he ridicules others for, for being weak, but in reality, it's himself that feels weak. So I hope that made sense. Let me know if it didn't. All right, so those are the various reasons. Just again, to review, we have his relationship with his father, his relationship with his mother, the relationship between the parents, the issue of looking like a girl, potentially genetics, inbreeding. There were other biological factors like the mom's drinking or the stress the mother had during the pregnancy. I provided a systemic explanation in which Joffrey was elected by the system to be this way in order to distract from the problems in the family. Joffrey might have been spoiled, and that might have been a reason as to why he did what he did. He was traumatized, and that might have been a factor. His, his life stage of trying to individuate might have been a factor. And then I provided a lot of defense mechanisms that might have been at play that would have resulted in his behavior. All right, so what's my diagnosis? Well, looking in the DSM-5, which has all sorts of problems with it, but it is the manual that all of us professionals use, 
If I'm using the constructs that the authors of the DSM-5 put forth, I would say that he fits the construct of the conduct disorder, which is described as a repetitive and persistent pattern of behavior in which the basic rights of others or major age-appropriate societal norms or rules are violated. In other words, a person who violates others' basic rights and is cruel to others frequently. Uh, it has to be, uh, there need to be at least three of the following 15 criteria in the past 12 months. So let's look at these criteria. So um, the first category of criteria are the aggression to people and animals. So does he often bully, threaten, or intimidate others? Yes. So we got one. Does he often initiate physical fights? I would say no, but you could interpret it as yes, because he would use his guards to abuse people. So that's an unsure one. Has he used a weapon that has caused serious physical harm to others? Yes. He swung a sword at Arya and frequently orders his guards to do horrible things. So we have two so far. Um, has he been physically cruel to people? Yes. Three. Has he been physically cruel to animals? You could say yes. The cat incident was cruel and strange. So yeah, we'll put that as a yes. So we have four out of five. Has he stolen while confronting a victim? This is a weird way of describing this in the DSM, but essentially have they mugged, you know, has the person mugged someone or stolen someone in a, in a physical way? And I could say probably not, but uh, I might be forgetting something, so we'll, we'll say no to that one. Has he forced someone into sexual activity? Well, he certainly planned on it. He planned on raping Sansa. So we'll say a maybe on that one too. Um, the next category is destruction of property. So has he deliberately engaged in fire setting? with the intention of causing serious damage? I don't think so. Has he deliberately destroyed others' property other than the fire setting? Yes. He, for instance, when he was given gifts at his wedding, if you remember, he took his brand new Valerian sword and chopped a very coveted old book that Tyrion and Sansa gave him at his wedding day. What do you call his sword again? Widow's Widow's Whale, I think. What was the name of his store? His sword, Widow's Whale. What a classy name. Okay. Um, all right. The next category of in conduct disorder is deceitfulness or theft. Has he broken into someone else's house, building, or car? Uh, no, he wouldn't need to because he's the king. Um, does he often lie to obtain goods or favors or to avoid obligations? we would say yes, he lied when he got back to court after the incident with Arya and the butcher's boy. So yes, he, he does lie, but does he often lie? I don't know, that's um, unsure. Has he stolen items of non-trivial value without confronting a victim? For instance, shoplifting and this sort of stuff. Again, he's the king, he doesn't need to do any of that, so it's unclear as to whether or not he would do that if he was not the king. All right, the next, the last category is serious violation of rules. Uh, does he often stay out at night despite parental prohibitions? <laughs> um, doesn't apply to him. Uh, has he run away from home overnight? Again, doesn't apply to him. Uh, is he often truant from school? Again, doesn't apply to him. So, you know, we does he have at least three of the criteria? Yes, he has about half of them. So he does meet three of the 15, he does meet at least three of the 15 criteria. Does the disturbance in behavior cause clinically significant impairment in social, academic, or occupational functioning? This is always a debatable criteria to, to try to figure out. You know, did Joffrey's conduct problems present problems in his life? Uh, I would say yes, because eventually someone killed him. <laughs> so there are different specifiers. Uh, first is child onset type. These individuals show at least one symptom characteristic of conduct disorder prior to the age of 10 years old. We would say that yes, this was a childhood onset type of conduct disorder. There's another specifier with limited prosocial emotions. 
To qualify for this specifier, an individual must have displayed at least two of the following characteristics persistent over at least 12 months and in multiple relationships and settings. Uh, lack of remorse or guilt, callous lack of empathy, unconcerned about performance, and shallow or deficient affect. So yes, he definitely lacked remorse or guilt. He lacked empathy. He was he did not dis- express feelings or show emotions to others. So we would specify not only that the conduct disorder was child onset type, but it was also with limited prosocial emotions. Also, the last specifier category is whether or not it was mild, moderate, or severe. So let's see. I'm guessing it's severe. Many conduct problems in excess of those required to make the diagnosis are present or conduct problems cause considerable harm to others. So yes, we would say that he was severe. So diagnosis, DSM-5 is conduct disorder with child onset type, with limited prosocial emotions, and severe. So that is his diagnosis as I see it. Some people might wonder why I wouldn't apply the antisocial personality disorder or the narcissistic personality disorder or the old diagnosis of sadistic personality disorder. And the reasons for that is that he's too young. And I won't go into that because that's a long uh, topic to talk about. But essentially, teenagers are generally not diagnosed with personality disorders. And conduct disorder is seen by many to be a personality disorder of childhood. So often people with conduct disorder will develop antisocial personality disorder or some other personality disorder later in life, but not always for sure. All right. So let's go into uh, the last section here. I just want to talk about sadism in general, because I think the, the construct that is in psychology that best describes Joffrey Baratheon is sadism. He was sadistic. What's the definition of sadism? Well, there have been many definitions over the past 100 plus years, but basically most people's definitions center around one particular element, and that is is that sadists derive pleasure from the suffering of others. So the suffering of others can either be initiated by the, by the person or can be vicarious, meaning they, they see suffering happening. For instance, they might like to watch ultimate fighting because they get to see one guy beat the crap out of another guy. So the sadist isn't doing the beating, but they like to see someone get, get beat. So it's vicarious sadism. Or they might actually just like to do the beating themselves. So, and this isn't to say that everyone that loves... Um, ultimate fighting is a sadist. That is definitely not the case, but uh, sadists might be attracted to it. Another element that is often brought up as a definition of sadism is that not only do they derive pleasure from harming other people, but they also get off on controlling others and humiliating them. But this isn't always included in in the definition. And to me, it seems a little bit tertiary to the main issue of uh someone deriving pleasure from harming other people. So just know that for some people, they define also uh, sadists as getting off on controlling other people. Now, this isn't to say that all harm to other people indicates that someone is a sadist. For instance, some people have to resort to control or harm of other people, but these people might not actually take pleasure in it, if that makes any sense. So in other words, if someone's provoked to be controlling or harmful, uh, this, this doesn't necessarily indicate a sadistic personality. So for instance, uh, if you have an abusive husband, he might be a sadist, but he might not be. He might be controlling and abusive because he has difficulty controlling his emotions and because he is disturbed emotionally, and he resorts to control and uh, aggression to to modulate his own emotions. Whereas sadists, they just enjoy harming other people or seeing other people get harmed. it's It's a form of pleasure to them. It's not something that they resort to. So it's an important distinction to make. Uh, it's quite disturbing to think about, right, that there are some people out there that actually get off on harming others, but it's true. 
So some related constructs in psychology that I won't go into are antisocial personality disorder or sociopathy or psychopathy. These three different uh, diagnoses have a lot of overlapping elements uh, with each other and with sadism. All three of, you know, antisocial, sociopathy, and psychopathy, they all have many different criteria. But, but sadism is, is, is a very simple construct to understand. I mean, when, when you're trying to describe psychopathy to people, sometimes it takes a long time to describe. But sadism doesn't take much time at all because it's just the simple trait of taking pleasure in harming other people. So sadism, to some extent, is easier to teach and understand. Um, just as an example, to put this in real-world context, research has shown that Internet trolls are sadistic often. So, you, you know, uh, as an Internet person myself, I will say that I have been the victim of many online sadists that love to just hurt my feelings. It's, it's very strange. It's, it's like they know exactly what to say, or often they do, that can hurt my feelings. I mean, how do they know how to do that? It's because they have uh, built their life to some extent around learning how to harm people because it makes them feel good. They get a lot of pleasure going online and tearing people down. A lot of people think that, you know, they'll go on the internet and they'll just be like, man, the human race is seriously effed up. But that is not an accurate representation of the human race. The vast majority of people online don't comment at all. It's only the sadists in general that tend to comment. And so all those comments are sadists that are in the confines of their own homes and have the anonymity of the internet to uh, be able to do things that they couldn't do in real life. Because if they did this in real life, they'd get their ass kicked <laughs> or they'd go to jail or something. So the internet is this you know, place where they have free reign to be as sadistic as they want, and they do it all day long because they take so much pleasure in it. So it's just another way of looking at internet trolls and YouTube comments. Um, so other constructs that are often in the literature are sexual sadism and sadomasochism and sadistic personality disorder. So these are all different from just having a sadistic personality or a sadistic personality trait. Oh, again, I won't go into too much detail, but sexual sadism refers to the sexual arousal by making other people suffer. So sexual sadists are often rapists, or at least they have fantasies of rape. So sexual sadists specifically get pleasure from sexually harming other people, which is different from just general sadism. And then this is also different, I think, very different from sadomasochism or SNM, as you might have heard in you know the kink community. Uh, some a lot of times in the literature, sadism and sadomasochism get sort of lumped into the same thing, and I really think that that's irresponsible. And I think that they're very different things because SNM is consensual. People like to play out these roles where they are a sadist or they are being, you know, um, you know, dominated by someone else. That's the masochistic part, but it's all consensual. You know, if you enter into a consensual S and M relationship to me, there's nothing sadistic about that. It's role playing. People like to role play all sorts of things. They like to play all sorts of games and it feels good, but that's quite a different thing. I mean, if you took, I, in my estimation, the people that I know that do S and M, if you took any one of those people and actually asked them to actually harm another person, they wouldn't be able to do it because they have a normal conscience. So sadomasochism, in my mind, is quite different from sadism. Now, can a sadist take part in the kink community in S&M uh, behavior? Absolutely. But to confound sadomasochism with sadism, I think, is um, oppressive to the kink community. Also, the last one here is sadistic personality disorder. This was something that used to be in, I believe, the DSM-3. And, you know, and that was kaput uh, early 90s, mid 90s. The three went out of style. And back then, they actually had a personality disorder called sadistic personality disorder. Why they took it out, I have no idea because it's not as if they replaced it with anything. Maybe they just subsumed it under antisocial. I don't know. But it seems to me like it would have been uh, a good idea to keep it or at least uh, have it return. But, uh, but anyway. 
And the last thing that I'll say about the literature uh, regarding all these topics is that there's not much research in this area in sadism. I think people are frightened of sadism, so they don't go into it very often. Plus, it's not in vogue right now, so... I know there's just not a lot of research. So if you're planning on doing some research, I recommend looking into sadism because there's probably a lot of gaps in the research that you could fill. There are a number of psychological instruments or surveys or um, measures that have been developed by researchers to measure whether or not someone is sadistic. There are two of them uh, that I found. One that's called the Comprehensive Assessment of Sadistic Tendencies, or the CAST, Another one is the Short Sadistic Impulse Scale, which is a self-report tool that seems to work. So again, you you give someone a survey and you ask them a bunch of questions, and depending on their answers, you determine whether or not that person is sadistic. So just looking at um, some of the questions on the CAST or the Comprehensive Assessment of Sadistic Tendencies, So these are some of the questions, and the the respondent is asked to rate from one to five, with one being strongly disagree and five being strongly agree. So um, this 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 assessment measure it uh, measures whether or not someone is sadistic, but it also tries to figure out what type of sadist they are, whether or not they're a direct verbal sort of sadist, where they're you know meaning they like to directly verbally harm other people, whether they're a direct physical type of sadist, meaning they like to directly physically harm other people, or whether they're a vicarious sadist, meaning they like to watch other people harm other people. So questions within the direct verbal sadist type are things like, I was purposely mean to some people in high school. So if they rate this one toward the strongly agree side of things, this could indicate that they are a direct verbal sadist. Uh, The five other questions here are, I enjoy making jokes at the expense of others. I, I have purposely tricked someone and laughed when they looked foolish. When making fun of someone, it is especially amusing if they realize what I'm doing. Perhaps I shouldn't have, but I never got tired of mocking certain classmates. I would never purposely humiliate someone. So the reverse is the you know, indicator of whether or not someone is a sadist. So this is, these are all verbal, direct, sadist sorts of behaviors. Going into the direct physical type of sadism, I enjoy physically hurting people. I enjoy tormenting people. I have the right to push certain people around. I have dominated others using fear. I enjoy hurting my partner during sex or pretending to. So these are all indications of someone being a direct physical sadist. And of the vicarious questions are the following. In video games, I like the realistic blood spurts. I like the realistic blood spurts. So that's kind of interesting. I love to watch YouTube clips of people fighting. I enjoy watching cage fighting or MMA where there is no escape. I sometimes replay my favorite scenes from gory slasher films. I enjoy playing the villain in games and torturing other characters. In professional car racing, it's the accidents that I enjoy the most. So upon reading these questions, I, I, I'm a little uh, bothered by them because pe- a, lot of people, a lot of people like gory video games, for instance. You know, it seems, it seems like this vicarious sadist category will capture a lot of people that I personally would probably not characterize as sadistic, but that they just like to watch a lot of violence, you know? Because I consider these kinds of behaviors like watching YouTube clips of people fighting and watching, you know, ultimate fighting, very different from actually enjoying physically harming other people. I mean, these are two very different acts. So hmm, I, I don't know if I like this, this vicarious thing. I mean, to me, what would indicate vicarious sadism is if you liked watching beheading videos and really got off on it and, and got a tremendous amount of pleasure from watching you know, the faces of death and people actually uh, being beaten. You know, for instance, for myself... I don't watch videos on the internet that I know will have actual people being hurt 
because I'm traumatized by it. But, but if I actually liked watching these things and really got off on it, then, you know, I, I would say that's a s- indication of sadism. But watching cage fighting, I mean, I, I don't think that's a strong, in my opinion, indicator of sadism. Uh, well, so, but, but maybe if they can, you know, aggregate all these questions together and they score high on a lot of them, maybe that's an indication. So I don't know. So just some stats on sadism. Men, according to research, are more likely to be sadistic, but make no mistake about it. Women can be sadistic too. According to a review of lots of, lots of the literature, it seems about 30 or 40% of sadists are women, which might surprise people. So so again, getting back to Joffrey, we can definitely say he was sadistic, right? I mean, he clearly enjoyed hurting and terrorizing other people. He didn't do this because he had to. He didn't do it for political reasons. He did it purely because he liked to do it. I mean, everyone didn't even want him to do it. You know, when he cut off Ned Stark's head or ordered someone to do it, everyone was saying, no, don't do that. It's terrible. His own mom, everyone's, but, and politically, it's going to be terrible for you. But he just wanted to see Ned Stark get beheaded. And he, he loved it. And, you know, when they depict it in the TV show, he just loves it, you know, <laughs> even though it didn't serve him well. So what does the literature say regarding the causes of sadism? Well, some say, and there's some emerging research indicating this, that genetics and brain biology play a role in the cause of sadism. Uh, I found some research that indicates that sadists don't have different childhoods from non-sadists. So a common belief is, oh, he's a sadist. Well, his childhood must, must have been horrible, right? That's a very common belief in our culture. But some research is coming out saying that sadists don't have different childhoods from anyone else. You know, when you, when you take sadists and uh, assess their childhoods, they're just as likely to have abuse or um, ideal childhoods as a non-sadist would. So that's interesting. Um, some people postulate that it's normal to be slightly sadistic and that sadistic acts are pleasurable because the brain is seeking equilibrium. So uh, to go into some explanation on this, um, we might have evolved to cope with the stress of harming other people by developing a pleasure reaction to counterbalance the inner pain of harming other people. So, you know, just to put it into caveman terms, if you have a group of people and they need to you know, assert their territory by harming a rival tribe. They have to actually potentially kill other people and do it um, effectively without any remorse. And so in those circumstances, uh, because, I mean, normally speaking, us humans don't like harming other people because we are rewarded for being nice and we're punished in our brains for being mean to people. But sometimes, you know, tribe on tribe wars happen and you have to be mean to another tribe. And so, so our brains might have evolved a mechanism to reward us with a little bit of pleasure upon harming people in certain situations. You know, you can imagine after killing the rival tribe, everyone jumping around and celebrating and feeling elated. Well, that might be because of an evolved psychological mechanism that helps us in that situation. Because if we treated all humans with uh, the same morals that we treat our own families, uh, then uh, you could see another tribe coming along and eliminating you. And so, um, uh, and there's a lot of speculation that I'm putting forth because maybe tribes didn't actually exist like this in the past, but I think you get my point. So this, this, psychological mechanism of rewarding us for harming other people in normal people is very small, meaning that the mechanism only kicks in under certain circumstances, whereas with sadists, it might kick in all the time. So it it might be kind of a broken psychological mechanism, an overactive reward mechanism for harming other people that should only be reserved for specific incidents of harming other people, if that makes any sense. And, and this mechanism might be the reason why we love to watch sports so much. 
and we love to play video games so much and we love violent films so much because we get a little charge of pleasure harming other people and watching people get harmed because again our brain is trying to reward us for the assertion of our tribal territory but this is uh, at at best speculation at this point uh, more research is definitely needed along these lines and there are a lot of authors over the years that talked about this about sadism you know freud going way back to the early 1900s talked about how aggression originates from the death instinct i won't go into that but but to me all of them are just providing speculation because it's so difficult to determine the cause of human behavior. I mean, the brain is such a complex thing and human behavior is so complex, it's difficult to reduce it to a simple explanation. Okay, so that is my analysis of Joffrey Baratheon. I was thinking about doing a number of episodes on Game of Thrones because I love the books because I've read them. I mean, I, you know, listen to them. <laughs> so if you're interested, uh, let me know, and I will do other Game of Thrones analyses. And if you have a particular topic you want me to do, let me know. You can email me at contact at psychologyinseattle.com. That's contact at psychologyinseattle.com. Or you can go to our website, psychologyinseattle.com, and go to the Contact Us page. You can also donate, which is always nice, a nice way to show your appreciation. Uh, running this show does cost a certain amount of money, and I have yet to make back the uh, money that I've spent on it, so it would be nice if you donated. Um, and also, it would just be nice to hear from you, to hear what your thoughts are. I often wonder what people are thinking as I'm talking. You know, I'm talking away, and you're listening away with your earbuds in, and I'm just wondering what's going on in your head. Because if you are in the room with me, I'd be like, what do you think of that? And you'd be like... I think that's stupid, and you're a dumb person. So um, sometimes I wonder what's going on in your mind. So please email and let me know. Um, so what's the final word on Joffrey? I will say that when I experienced him in the books and in the TV show, I hated him. I had no compassion for the guy. But when I actually started to analyze his life and look at the circumstances in his life. I started to have a little bit more compassion for him. I don't have any compassion for his actions. He was a terrible, evil human being, and the you know world of Restoros is better off with him dead. But I can see possibly why he would have been the way that he was. And he had some struggles. He had some issues that he had to get through. And when I look at him as if he were a client, I, I do have compassion for him. And I do wonder what things would have been like if his father wasn't abusive, if his parents' relationship was stronger, if he wasn't raised as a prince, and if he w wasn't raised in a spoiled way. I wonder what he would have been like. Would he have been different? I, I think so. It's just a guess. Of course, he's a fictional, fictional character, and this is all ridiculous, and so I will end with that. Well, that does it for another episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me, and please take care of yourself. Mm -hmm.